Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dave Ellingson. I am the technical manager for the Nutrients Business Unit at Eurofins Food Chemistry Testing in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I have the pleasure of presenting today on human milk oligosaccharides. So a little bit of background, um, starting off first, HMOs are a non-digestible carbohydrate. And uh, what most people don't know is they are the third most abundant solid component after lactose and lipids in breast milk. They comprise roughly about 8% of the solids. Now, there are approximately 200 different HMOs that have been identified to date. Uh, about greater than 70% of this profile is comprised of 10 of these, with 2-FL or 2-fucosolactose uh, representing about roughly 30% of the profile. Now, these are typically categorized into, into three different areas, fucosylated, silated, and neutral. Now, if you look at these structures closely, um, they all start with a basic building block of lactose. Now that is a beta 1,4 bonded glucose and galactose. And then each of these are extended either with a fucose uh, to represent your fucosylated, uh, sialic acid to represent your silated, and then N-acetylglucosamine is part of the structure for neutral OS. Now in regards to prevalence again in, in the mother's breast milk, um, I'm going to identify seven of these HMOs that Eurofin's uh, methodology has identified. And, and they're also uh, more of the common HMOs that are being used in products today. The first one, 2-FL is 2-fucosolactose. Uh, the fifth most uh, uh, prevalent is uh, lacto-N-tetraose. The sixth is 3-fucosolactose. Seventh is six sialolactose. Ninth is lacto N neotetraose. Tenth is dipucolactose, dipucosolactose. And thirteenth is three sialolactose. Now, if, if you look at this, there's kind of an equal distribution of, of the seven here in each of the three categories. And uh, the majority of these are represented by the most simplest structures. So when we talk about benefits, right, if they're 8% of, of the solids uh, um, in the human milk, um, what benefit do they provide? Well, first off, they are a prebiotic, so they promote the growth of beneficial intestinal bacteria. Uh, but they also supply sialic acid for brain development, so their silated uh, oligosaccharides provide that. Uh, third, and I think this is um, probably what most people are interested in at this time, is their immune function. And uh, they kind of serve as a decoy, and the image below uh, really helps explain this. So if we start off on the top left, uh, the HMO can bind. Uh, to the bacteria. So it's looking for a target site, right? The HMO can serve as a decoy and bind to that bacteria so it's not able to bind to the surface of an epithelial cell. The other way it can do it is the HMO can bind to the surface of the epithelial cell and uh, block that target for the bacteria. It also uh, can be taken in by that cell and then configured and displayed on the surface uh, with a different sugar moiety that the bacteria uh, does not recognize. So overall, uh, it enhances the intestinal, epithelial, and immune cell responses. We talk about current industry trends. Uh, by far, infant formula is the largest application for HMOs. Uh, 2FL is very common. It's been around for a while. Uh, you see it in many different brands, many different types of, of commercial IF out there. But recently, in the last few years, uh, they've been combining 2FL with uh, possibly another HMO. Um, or uh, most recently, there is now a, a mix of five uh, that they've put into products that's available commercially. 
Now, historically, cost has, has been a big issue here, and, and, and to produce this uh, on a large scale has really inhibited its use. So what you'll see, manufacturers have been using uh, FOSS and GOSS, which stand for fructooligosaccharides and galactooligosaccharides. And, and those are other prebiotics, and what they're used, you know, they're used to mimic the function of the HMOs. Uh, but now what you'll see more recently is companies are starting to invest uh, and partner with other HMO manufacturers, um, and they're really working on the science and the synthesis of, of these to produce on a large scale uh, to make more cost efficient. So really you look at metabolic engineering and fermentation or uh, possible protein engineering to produce enzymatically um, as means to, to uh, produce on a large scale. So when we think about methods for HMOs, now methods have existed for some time, but you know, we were always looking at maybe one HMO or maybe two HMOs in the profile. Now, infant formula, as a lot of people know, is a very complex matrix. And the challenge is to be able to analyze multiple of these HMOs if they're starting to put them into products. And traditionally, HPAC, PAD, or high-performance anion exchange chromatography uh, with pulse amperometric detection has been used, or a refractive index. Uh, now, the issue with that is in the formulas, they are uh, fortifying with other oligosaccharides, other prebiotics, and these detection techniques will actually produce responses uh, in the chromatogram, um, and that interferes with specificity. So what ends up happening uh, is, is you're having to run different types of treatments, possibly different types of separations to get uh, each of the uh, different HMOs that may be in the product. Now, the other, other thing is sensitivity. Um, the industry is looking at low concentrations for HMOs, and, and they're really looking at uh, the mother's breast milk. What is the intrinsic concentration for some of these HMOs? Well, this is really geared towards refractive index, but it's, it's very challenging for, for that detection to meet the concentrations that industry needs. And then the last one, uh, mass spectrometry. Um, really, it, it's, it's just a lack of available uh, labeled internal standards at this point to accurately quantitate uh, an infant formula. So with all of that, uh, AOAC, uh, in the stakeholder panel for infant formula and adult nutritionals, um, recognize the, the need for a method, a, a reference method for HMOs, and they're, they're becoming more and more popular. So they got a working group together, and they developed uh, SMPRs for uh, seven different HMOs, and that is uh, standard method performance requirements. Those seven HMOs are shown here. And then they uh, put out a call for a method. So if you had a, a method that you were using, um, or if you wanted to develop a method, you could submit that uh, for consideration for the, the first step, which would be first action status. So in early 2020, Eurofins uh, started on a project to develop a method for HMOs. And the main goal in mind here was to develop a method that could measure multiple HMOs in one analysis. And uh, it took roughly about a year of development, six to eight months of validation, and, uh, and then we were able to finally submit this method to, to AOC SPIFAN, um, and it did receive first action official method status this past April. It can measure up to six HMOs, those are listed below there. Now, internally, we are also trying to think, well, we want a robust method. We want to be able to analyze across different product types. Okay, so what else are they putting HMOs into? Right, so dietary supplements, commodities, premixes, that all comes to mind. Right, so we have the capability to also measure up to seven HMOs in these types of matrices and the additional one there being DFL or diflucosolactose. Now, I think um, the big thing or advantage with, with the Eurofins method is its simplicity, um, coupled with the sensitivity and the specificity that it provides. Uh, it uses standard HPLC instrumentation 
and, and fluorescence detection. Now we harness the fluorescence detection for that sensitivity, and then the method uses derivatization to provide the specificity. And so we are able to separate and analyze uh, the multiple HMOs in one injection, and, and there's actually just one treatment uh, for, for infant formulas across all types. Um, the other big thing is reference, reference standards. That's always been a question with HMOs and, and quantification. Um, we chose to use analytical grade reference standards because we are looking for materials that have been uh, thoroughly characterized so we have a type of reference uh, that everybody can use uh, moving forward. And there are a couple of companies that are offering that out there. Uh, and lastly, this is an ISO accredited method. Um, diving deeper into the method itself, uh, the derivatization, it uses 2AB derivatization. Uh, that is a common uh, glycan analysis derivatization, reductive amination, uh, to add a fluorophore onto the HMO. These are carbohydrates. We need to add a chromophore and able to detect by fluorescence. Um, some of the things that we have done with this method, we have substituted a non-toxic reducing agent. Um, typically with this, this type of derivatization, a, a sodium cyanobarhydride is used, but that can produce um, toxic uh, hydrogen cyanide uh, upon hydrolysis. So we've eliminated that. Um, we've automated the cleanup of the derivatized sample. Now, typically, uh, that is done offline through SPE. Um, now, that can be done manually, or there, are, there is uh, methods for automation for that uh, offline, but we've done it on instrument, and, and the way that we do that is through a guard column. Uh, so we inject. All of the excess labeling reagent flows to waste. Then the analytical column is brought back in line, and the analytes are eluded and separated. And uh, we use HILIC, um, which again is a very common uh, 2AB labeled glycan uh, separation technique. The images below uh, show the stable derivative. Uh, uh, that is the that would be like a reducing end of an oligosaccharide. And then, and then the image on the right side is just a, a quick Jablonski diagram of the excitation and emission uh, wavelengths. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. I thank you all for joining. Uh, like Amy said, there will be questions at the end. I look forward to uh, uh, talking with all of you. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave. So I am going to pass over um, the presentation to um, Jeff right now. And as Dave mentioned, um, feel free at any point in time um, to go ahead and submit any questions um, that you may have. So Jeff, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you all. I'm Jeff. Uh, I work in proteomics. I'm a technical manager, but I'm also the principal scientist for proteomics at our Madison lab. Uh, we analyze a variety of different matrices for basically targeted protein quantitation or characterization, uh, looking at dietary supplements, infant formula, dairy matrices, and also into egg biotech matrices. So I will briefly introduce protein because it is such a different analyte than, uh, than what was just discussed or other small molecules. I'm going to walk through briefly some protein analysis techniques and why we've chosen LC mass spec for our recent methods. I'll also go over some challenges for any targeted protein analysis and then move into the three proteins that we're going to focus on here today similar to Dave's uh, presentation on um, getting these, well, two of these proteins into infant formula uh, by manufacturers late. So a brief introduction of protein. Uh, protein is fundamental to a healthy diet. I think most people realize that. There are at least 10,000 proteins in the human body and similar amounts in other animals. Uh, we take protein in through our diet. It is digested in our body and then used to synthesize the unique proteins per species. 
Uh, there are nine essential amino acids that your body cannot produce, so it's it's important to have a varied diet. And uh, just listed the general guidelines for protein intake here. In terms of structure, we can think of proteins at a very basic level as chains of amino acids. So just a straight chain. Each of these letters here in the upper left is uh, an amino acid residue, all connected. But then it gets complex pretty quick as based on the order of amino acids, we get some differential folding, some helices. And then in addition, we get attachments between the chain in different spots by a variety of ways. And that gives us tertiary structure and folding of the protein. So we only have exposed certain residues and it's pretty tough to understand which ones we can, we can work with when we're analyzing these. Uh, finally, on top of that, there are post-transitional modifications, which are different uh, compounds attached to the protein, and I'll discuss that in a little more detail uh, down the line here. So in terms of analytical techniques for proteomics, there are a ton uh, from the basic polyacrylamide gels, where we're just uh, separating proteins out by size and how they migrate through a gel matrix to your typical HPLC is used for purification and analysis of proteins. The most common method is amino assay. This would be your ELISAs using an antibody to bind a particular antigen on the protein surface. And with that, there are a lot of uh, different techniques that follow off of that, including lateral flow devices for detection, uh, ELISA for rough quantitation of proteins, and then biosensors for a little more specific quantitation and inflow devices. We can also use these for purification and extraction um, and for blots to detect. Uh, you, can, you can do some different things to proteins to figure out uh, structure and other characterization. Uh, we specialize in mass spectrometry methods here at Madison. Uh, there are a couple varieties. The high resolution mass spec would be usually used more for characterization work. We tend to focus on triple quadrupole mass spec just because that's a more high throughput technique and a little more sensitive for us. And I'll, I'll discuss some of those details as we go. So there are a lot more than what I've listed here. These are just some of the most common. Uh, they're all very critical to characterizing proteins and analysis. So what are the challenges for targeted protein analysis? Um, as David mentioned, standards are very important for any analytical method. Uh, when we're talking about proteins, we have a, even, even the, the simple explanation in a textbook is a pretty complex sample. But then once we get into the reality of the situation, we get uh, what's called the proteoform, which includes all the different modifications that can occur with proteins physiologically. So depending on the diet of the animal, depending on the time of the year that a crop comes or what the, what the rain situation was, we can get different attachments to the protein. And these are I've just represented by some basic shapes here, but we can see uh, the differences that might occur in, in a sample. And our standards are all derived from these biological samples as well. So our standard may not match our sample. So it's an important, uh, important thing to consider whenever we're talking about uh, quantitating proteins is all the different forms we can see. And these different forms can affect our chromatography. They can obviously affect our observed mass when we're talking mass spectrometry, which is where we specialize. And then also even in uh, access of the enzyme to generate peptides if we want to go that route. Uh, finally, food processing effects can have a big, big uh, impact on what the protein looks like and what is, what is left attached or any changes to the structure that can occur uh, through heat or pressure or even just putting it into solution with, with other proteins can cause some, uh, some issues. So moving on to specific human and bovine milk proteins, uh, we can see here on the left that the, there's quite a big difference between human milk and bovine milk, both in terms of protein content and the types of proteins that are observed in those, in those proteins. So we can see that human milk is 
60% wave fraction, 40% casein fraction, and in those fractions, it's just basically how the proteins precipitate. And bovine milk is 20 to 80. Then within those fractions, we can see there's a large difference of specific proteins. And I've just highlighted a few from the whey fraction here, but we can see that alpha lactobumin and lactoferrin are very prevalent in human milk, but not nearly as much in bovine milk. And then beta lactoglobulin does not have a clear uh, analog in uh, uh, any similar protein as in bovine milk, but it's uh, very highly expressed in bovine milk. So with these differences, we've seen, just like with uh, HMOs, we've seen a lot of effort to get infant formula that matches this protein profile as close as possible. And with that, we've had to develop some methods to analyze for these proteins. So to go over some highlights of the three proteins, uh, lactoferrin is uh, iron binding, Hence the ferrin in the Latin name. Uh, it is a very large protein, uh, 80 kilodaltons, about 700 amino acids long. Um, it's found in all biological fluids. It has a lot of uh, immunological pr uh, properties that have been identified so far. And there's actually a pretty big uh, research group that meets annually at a conference worldwide on, on just lactoferrin. So, seen a lot of interest in that, in that particular protein worldwide for all the different effects it can have. Alpha lactobumin is not quite as prevalent so far, but growing. Uh, it is a smaller protein, 14 kilodaltons, 123 amino acids. It is a very high proportion of the total protein in breast milk, which is a lot of the motivation to incorporate it. Uh, and it is mainly heavily involved in lactose synthesis as a subunit of the enzyme lactose synthase. Uh, it's been implicated in a lot of, lot of other biological processes as well. Uh, Beta-lactoglobulin, not present in human milk, also a smaller protein. Um, really the main uh, literature that we find on this is just as a as a surrogate for milk allergy testing. Uh, not, not a whole lot on the beneficial effects that we've seen for uh, mother's milk. But it is it does come along with alpha lactobumin because we are isolating that fraction from bovine milk. So uh, there's been an interest to monitor it. So how do we execute targeted protein connotation in urofins? Uh, there's a couple different methods. Uh, we are able to use UV 280 nanometers with HPLC for our high level samples and supplements. Uh, what we've done to improve this to make sure that, uh, that we're not getting other things in that chromatogram, uh, 280 nanometers is a pretty general wavelength. A lot of things will, will absorb at that wavelength. We've, we've added it in line to a, a time of flight mass spec instrument to allow us to positively ID what that peak is. So I've included here a picture of just our instrument. It's just a UV and then downline we have our mass spec attached and then also some mass profiles. So we can see here from lactoferrin, we get uh, a lot of different charge states. It's a, it's a very big protein. So we see 25 to 30 charge states and here I've, uh, combined an overlay of a blue sample with a red standard and that is just showing that those samples match in their profile so we can positively say that that's lactoferrin. We can't quantitate using that data just based on the mass differences however. And then below that uh, below that first picture on the bottom I have a overlay of a deconvoluted mass profile so from the differences of those mass peaks we can isolate uh, what the mass is down to uh, basically Dalton units. And that's actually two standards. So we can see between those two standards, the black and the red, there's a, there's a difference observed. It looks small, but it's actually several hundred Daltons. So that just illustrates the difference we see between, uh, between even standards, let alone samples. So when we get into more complex samples like infant formula, uh, UV detection can, can 
start to not work so well. And this is just an example of alpha lactobumin uh, standard in red overlaid with the infant formula sample in blue. So we know that in infant formula, there are a lot of different proteins, a lot of different other things in there that are tough to isolate chromatographically. Uh, so we need some sort of specific cleanup or we need a new strategy. So we have done some cleanups, but we've really moved most of our uh, targeted methods to more higher throughput methods. And we're using quantitation using a surrogate peptide. So here again, I've listed the entire amino acid sequence of lactoferrin at the bottom, and I've highlighted two peptides that will be cut by a specific enzyme, in this case, uh, trypsin enzyme. Uh, we can get very high purity trypsin enzyme, and with that, we can generate these peptides reliably from the protein, and with a lot of optimization, we can uh, get those to quantify comparably to a standard and we can quantitate using just those peptides and then correlate back to the standard. Also, with this approach, we don't have to worry about a lot of the, the PTMs that are present because we're just looking at the peptides. And we can incorporate an internal standard, which is uh, quite important for any mass spec analysis to normalize the ionization inefficiencies that we see in the complex sample. So with this, we can uh, order both the native peptide that we would observe in the sample itself, in the protein itself, and then also uh, have a heavy label, which would have a 13C label to differentiate the weight, and then we can use that as internal standard. And these have really uh, come into uh, more reasonable cost over the last five to 10 years where we can implement these in all our methods. So our finished product analysis for lactoferrin in dietary supplements and infant formula was published in 2019 in Journal of AOIC. If people are interested at all in uh, learning the, more of the details of the method, uh, you can see just another representation of the, the protein at the bottom here, denaturing it, opening it up, digesting it, and then we analyze for those pep peptides, and we get very nice clean chromatograms. Uh, that look a lot different than an infant formula on UV. Uh, another example of this approach using surrogate peptides is with alpha lactobumin and beta lactoglobulin. So again, I've highlighted in the sequence here, the sequences are a lot shorter, the quantitative peptides and the qualitative peptides to confirm that it is that protein. And using those, we use a slightly different approach to the lactoferrin method in that we can load our infant formula sample onto a molecular weight cutoff filter and anything that is not retained by that filter will go to waste so then we can isolate proteins and treat them uh, in that way and this is a somewhat new technique that's been uh, growing in popularity just for its simplicity then when we digest that those proteins that are in the filter and spin them down again now it's just peptides so they'll flow right through and then we can analyze it and extract And again, we get very nice clean uh, chromatograms uh, for these peptides because it's been cleaned up and uh, we're only looking at uh, what we want to look like as opposed to you. So the last important point is on standards. And for uh, standards, we need something that we can rely on. And we've usually in protein analysis, you, you get kind of general grades of protein standards, but recently uh, some companies have been releasing uh, certified reference materials which are very well characterized. I just grabbed a couple of screenshots from a C of A to see uh, the, the purity and again the mass profile of what they're of what we're using for materials. So this is what we can we would compare our analyses to. And for these three compounds we do have certified reference material, which is uh, important. So in conclusions, I'll, I'll be brief, but I just wanted to highlight that human milk and bovine milk have very distinctive proteomes, and uh, that really explains the, the new interest in this area, and that targeted protein analysis can be uh, pretty complex, and it requires some different approaches than, uh, than some of the other methods uh, that we run around here for small molecules.
that. Thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation, Jeff. It looks like we have had a few questions um, come into the chat at this time. So again, I would invite um, if anyone has any questions to certainly add them. If for some reason we do not get to them live today, uh, we certainly will follow up with those. So um, looking at the first question here, um, can you provide the current status of where the method is in regards to publication and moving to the multi-laboratory study with a OAC. I don't know who wants to take that, yep. Dave. <laughs> I can take that question. Um, currently, the, the method is under uh, uh, publication for uh, first action status, um, and we will be looking to uh, work on a, a study for a multi-lab here eventually after that gets published. So um, that's that's coming very soon. Right, thank you. Um, and then again, the next um, question here, you stated that this method is also capable of analysis for dietary supplements. What forms of supplements can be tested at this point? So we've, we've been able to do uh, capsules, tablets, powders, premixes, and gummies. Right, thanks. Um, and it looks like we have, I'm just um, following up here on the questions that have come in. Um, it looks like we have one more at this time. Um, is there any pretreatment to remove interfering sugars or what specificity does the method have for other oligosaccharides? So uh, pretreatment is, uh, involves an amylglucosidase to remove um, uh, glucose derivatives, but otherwise, um, Galactoligosaccharides uh, are, are typically not an issue. Uh, there is one of the HMOs of the profile that uh, GOS is an issue for, but otherwise, it's a, a fully has full specificity with formulas with with GOS. FOS um, is not derivatized, uh, so that is not a problem. Polydextrose uh, that is also not a problem for the method. Um, so it does have high specificity in the presence of. Uh, some of these other oligosaccharides and, and the ones that do, uh, we just remove. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and it looks like I've been um, keeping up with the chat here. I don't see um, any other questions um, that have come in. Um, so again, I think that will wrap up our session for today. Um, I wanna make a couple of reminders again, everyone will receive a copy of um, the recording of this webinar along with the slides and we'll send that out most likely in three business days. Um, again, I wanna thank you Dave and Jeff for your expertise and presentations today and thanks everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your day.